Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar titled Accelerate Your Enterprise AI on Snowflake with H2O.AI. My name is Patrick Moran. I'm on the marketing team here at H2O.AI. I'd love to start off by introducing our speakers. Uh, Eve Laurent is Director of Partnerships and Alliances at H2O.AI. Eric Goodgen is Senior Solutions Architect at H2O.AI. And Chris Puglio is Vice President of Data Science and Anal Analytics at Snowflake. And Isaac Kunin is a Senior Product Manager at Snowflake. Now, before I hand it over to Eve, I'd like to uh, go over the following housekeeping items. Um, please feel free to send us your questions throughout the session via the questions tab in your console. We'll be happy to answer them towards the end of the webinar. And this webinar is being recorded. A copy of the webinar recording and slide deck will be made available after the presentation is over. And without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Eve. Thank you, Patrick, and thanks everybody uh, for joining this webinar uh, together with uh, Snowflake. Uh, we're really excited about uh, this uh, partnership and uh, the next level of integration of uh, H2O driverless AI with, uh, within the Snowflake environment. From an agenda perspective, uh, we will start off uh, talking a little bit about uh, the barriers to AI, AI adoption and how H2O and Snowflake help customers accelerate their journey on AI and machine learning. Uh, I will cover that part and then I will hand it over to Chris Pouliot, uh, who basically will talk about the Snowflake cloud data platform for data science and machine learning. And then we'll dive right in with Eric, who's going to do a demo to demonstrate the integration of driverless AI uh, with Snowflake. After the demo, we'll pass it on to uh, Isaac Kunin, who will talk a little bit more about the Snowflake external function capability that we're using for the integration of driverless AI uh, with Snowflake. And then uh, basically uh, review a little bit uh, the roadmap and milestones as the uh, uh, external function is being uh, released into the marketplace. And then we'll open it up for uh, some uh, questions as well from the audience. So for those of you uh, who joined this webinar and might be less familiar with H2O, let me quickly provide with a brief snapshot on uh, who we are and what we do. Uh, H2O got founded in 2012, so we've been around for a while now. Uh, we started off uh, with uh, providing a open source machine learning platform uh, to the market, and we have seen since a huge adoption with companies of this uh, open source software for machine learning. Uh, we have over 20,000 companies who are making use of H2O, uh, and we uh, created a uh, community of users of over 180,000 uh, members. Uh, we have also a massive adoption and usage uh, within the uh, academic and university environment as well. Uh, from a portfolio perspective, uh, as I mentioned, we started off with uh, H2O open source, but a number of years ago, uh, we also introduced our uh, commercial automatic machine learning platform, which is called HO Driverless AI, that complements uh, the open source uh, machine learning platform and addresses some of the key uh, needs that we have identified with customers as they embark on their machine learning uh, journey. Um, we have established uh, a wide variety of uh, customers that are using H2O uh, across multiple verticals uh, uh, from uh, financial services, insurance, as well as uh, healthcare, uh, manufacturing, uh, retail, and you name it. So, so a very broad cross uh, vertical adoption. So uh, if I uh, basically would summarize uh, what we have heard uh, from our customers uh, as they embark on their uh, data science and machine learning journeys, we see that uh, lots of customers have captured massive amounts of data. They continue to capture more and more data as, as, uh, as part of their uh, business. Uh, now, the question uh, for those companies is, how do we extract more value from the data uh, we captured? And uh, obviously, uh, data science and machine learning is a great way not only to look back at what happened uh, uh, to the business, 
but better understand uh, what uh, will happen moving forward. And so look at the predictive power that is embedded within the data to make better business decisions. Uh, in order to do that, uh, companies are highly dependent on uh, data scientists uh, because data science, it's all about extracting new uh, predictive insights uh, from the data they have to inform uh, lines of businesses. Uh, however, that whole process tends to be very difficult, tedious, and is highly dependent uh, on very skilled uh, resources. And it's not only the data scientist that is uh, a key uh, player in that process, uh, but also uh, other uh, functions within the, uh, the customer's environment who then need to take those models that are being developed by data scientists and put them in production. Uh, then uh, basically the customer depends on data ops people as well as data engineers to actually uh, extract value from the models that data scientists are, are building. Um, and that becomes a very uh, lengthy, difficult process as well. And the whole idea of the integration of driverless AI with Snowflake is to streamline that end-to-end -end process from uh, right uh, of, uh, the beginning at the start of uh, developing machine learning models all the way to uh, putting those models in production and scoring uh, data as new data is being captured uh, by uh, customers. So let's look at uh, what type of uh, challenges customers are facing as they embark on, on doing their uh, machine learning uh, projects. Uh, the first one is around talent. Uh, talent, it's all about capturing the uh, scarce uh, resources of data scientists that are out there uh, and uh, make them more productive. Um, it is a very uh, lengthy process uh, to build machine learning models and it requires lots of unique expertise. Um, now at H2O, we employ um, a number of Kaggle grandmasters. And these are people who basically compete on uh, data science uh, projects that are being provided through the Kaggle platform. And uh, based on that expertise of uh, competing on those data science uh, projects, uh, we capture and codify some of that experience within the uh, driverless AI uh, platform so that uh, uh, data scientists can use this as a productivity tool as they build their models. Uh, given that data science is a very iterative process, uh, the question is how much can we automate uh, within the uh, model development process uh, within the platform? And so driverless AI, it's all about um, automation of data science and machine learning tasks uh, that can speed up the creation of highly accurate models. And then the third component uh, that lots of customers are expecting uh, from a machine learning platform is making sure that once the models are built, that uh, we can explain the behavior of the models. Uh, especially in highly regulated environments, uh, customers uh, don't want to deploy models in production that they cannot explain how uh, those decisions are being made. So within driverless AI, we focus on machine learning interpretability uh, and have a number of capabilities to explain the behavior of those models. So what makes the uh, model development uh, process so complex? Well, there's a number of steps that uh, data scientists uh, typically go through. Uh, and each of those steps, it's not a one-off. It's a very iterative process. So once they go through this process, they basically need to look at uh, the result uh, of the model and see if they can go back and improve uh, upon how the model has been, uh, been built. Uh, the first step in that whole process, it's uh, feature engineering. It's really uh, the way of creating new data out of the existing data that is available to, uh, uh, to the data scientists. Uh, there's a data transformation that is going to happen uh, by creating new features that will improve the accuracy of the model that is being developed. And that is being provided at, uh, as input to the actual model building, where uh, specific machine learning algorithms will be selected 
uh, then uh, there's a task of hyperparameter tuning that needs to uh, take place. Uh, and then potentially as m multiple models are being uh, created and developed, see if uh, more accurate models can be created by combining multiple models together, which we call a stacked ensemble. So all of those steps uh, in the model creation will be automated within the driverless AI platform. And then once the model is being built, then obviously you want to put it into production where it will uh, actually generate uh, business value. And so the whole process from uh, going to model development to model deployment uh, tends to be also a very complicated task where uh, other resources come into the picture in addition to the data scientists. This is where data engineers or data ops people uh, have the responsibility to take those models and making sure that they can be operationalized. And so driverless AI will create a, a scoring pipeline that includes also the feature engineering in that scoring pipeline and then deploy it in a very flexible manner depending on the customer environment. So it can be embedded in the application or it can be deployed as a uh, REST server uh, that can be called by applications for scoring data. Um, so all of that is being combined into uh, driverless AI. And you see here a visual representation of the user interface of driverless AI. It's a, a graphical user interface that is easy to use. You can quickly point to the data set that you want to use and import into the platform uh, and then uh, uh, identify uh, the target uh, variable that you want to predict on. And from there on, uh, the platform will start doing the feature engineering, uh, building the models, the hyperparameter tuning, all the way up to creating a scoring pipeline, which we call a uh, mojo, uh, which is a piece of embeddable code that can be deployed, which I mentioned, as, as a REST endpoint or uh, can be embedded in, in uh, other uh, types of environments. Now, let's talk a little bit about... Uh, uh, how uh, the process of uh, model building and deployment happens in conjunction within a snowflake environment. So in a traditional environment, you would use driverless AI uh, to train a model, deploy it, and then when you have all of your data that resides within a snowflake environment, in order to score uh, data, you would have to export that data into some type of a file format like CSV or any type of uh, other file format, and then push that into a scoring engine. Where that scoring engine will score the data using the model that has been deployed. And then once all of those uh, results are uh, available, you would have to write back uh, the predictions into a Snowflake environment. So even though it looks very simple on a slide, it's quite tedious to set up from a operations perspective. Now Snowflake introduced external functions about a month ago, and this is the kind of feature that we have been using uh, to uh, be able to call driverless AI as a remote service from within Snowflake. So at this point in time, uh, using the external function, we can call uh, driverless to uh, uh, train or retrain if a model has been already deployed but needs to be retrained, uh, uh, train a model, automatically deploy it as a uh, REST server, and um, at that point in time, make it available to score using standard SQL statements and commands um, to score the data from within Snowflake. So no need to export uh, the data uh, and then write back the results into Snowflake, but do everything from within Snowflake with a very seamless uh, user experience using uh, the uh, typical uh, Snowflake user interface. And that's what we will show later on in the webinar, um, uh, and that's what Eric will, will demonstrate. Uh, but before that, let me hand it over to uh, Chris Pulio uh, from Snowflake. And he will talk a little bit about uh, how uh, the Snowflake Cloud Data Platform uh, is the uh, platform uh, of choice for uh, data science workloads. Yeah, thanks, Yves. Um, 
So one thing, you know, uh, and I've been uh, doing data science for a long time now at, at Netflix and Lyft and Neo and now Snowflake. And what I've learned along the way is, is like 80% uh, of, the, of the machine learning process is data preparation, right? You want to uh, create your training data set you want to do feature engineering, you want to augment your training data set with third party data. Uh, and uh, this 80% is the part which Snowflake uh, as, a, as, a, as a cloud data warehouse and now a cloud data platform, you know, does really well and excels at. Um, for actual machine learning, then we partner with machine learning platforms like H2O, world-class leading platforms to actually do the computation to actually train, train the model. Uh, and then we have hundreds of customers that use Snowflake along with our machine learning partners like H2O in order to uh, do machine learning at scale within their companies to have business impact. So uh, first, you know, uh, you know, uh, this is a build of a slide. Uh, I want to talk about some Snowflake specific features that help enable uh, um, you know, machine learning and this 80% uh, of the uh, creating the uh, training data set. So at the top, we have the machine learning process where you said you collect the data, you want to do exploratory data analysis, understand the data, the correlations, you know, uh, and things like that. Uh, then, you know, you want to uh, augment your data with, tra you know, transformations, uh, train your model, deploy it, and then evaluate how well it's doing, and then iterate. So a lot of these uh, steps along the process are iterative. You're going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You know, you, you collect your data, you visualize it, you, you realize that, hey, I want to add more data, or I want to transform data. You train your model, you look at the performance of the model, it's, hey, it's not as good as I, I would like. So then I go back and say, hey, how can I add, do some more feature engineering in order to make the model, model better? So, et cetera. So, um, so going going forth, um, you know, at, at you know at the you know, at the bottom, uh, just like highlight some of the things where, um, you know, you know, uh, you know, with the with the you know, Snowflake as a as a uh, as a uh, data platform, you know, all the data in one place. Uh, as a database, you have governance in terms of like you have role you have, you have roles to allow uh, select access to the data based upon your need to know. Uh, you know, zero, near zero maintenance, so that we don't have to require a lot of DBAs in order to tune the warehouse. You know, that's all done behind the scenes automatically. And then, uh, you know, performance is really good because as a, as a warehouse, uh, uh, we, uh, when, when it was designed from scratch for the cloud, we decompose uh, storage and compute. So storage, you just store your data. So for an Amazon use case, you know, you just store it in uh, S3. And then a warehouse, which is a compute resource, whenever you need that, you spin one up, which is like an EC2 instance. You point that at the data, you do your compute, and then you can, cl you can uh, close it down. Uh, if you, you could have your own warehouse or you could share warehouses and you can resize warehouses, that's all up to you based upon your cost performance trade-off. Um, so going on to uh, the first column now, looking at collecting data, uh, you know, we, we um, support uh, continuous micro batch ingest. So Snowpipe is a, is a, a, is a Snowflake uh, functionality that enables data loading as soon as the data is available on a stage, you know, the micro batching. So that's a super useful uh, Snowflake feature. Um, then, you know, we support, uh, you know, semi-structured data. So uh, JSON, which is super useful because a lot of the data that people are ingesting is in JSON format, and we, we support that natively. Um, and then I talked about before about like uh, ingesting third-party data. So I think this is a very powerful feature of Snowflake. So we have a marketplace for third-party data called the Data Exchange. And say, for example, you're a business and you're interested in uh, seeing whether or not weather uh, impacts your business. Uh, so maybe you uh, contact a weather provider, and then, and, you know, in the past, the way that this works is the weather provider, uh, you might have to negotiate a contract, and then they, they're going to have an, an API endpoint for you to hit to, in order to get the data. Then you can have to set up that pipeline and then also uh, ingest that data uh, into your warehouse, and it's a very fragile process. 
But say, for example, this weather provider is a Snowflake customer and you're a Snowflake customer. You can imagine all it takes is, a, is a basically a permissions issue. So the weather provider just has to grant you permissions to view their data, uh, you know, uh, which is like super slick and easy. And as the weather provider updates their data, you, are, you automatically see the most up-to-date version of that in your view. Uh, so that's uh, super exciting. Um, and then going on to the next, visualize and understand. Um, so one of the things that, which is really useful is uh, external tables. So uh, in external tables, you might not have to like ingest all your data into Snowflake in order to use it. So you can query with external tables, you can query data stored in an external stage, for example, S3. Uh, and then you can make the decision whether or not that's useful or not to, in order to like mainstream that into your ETL uh, process. Um, another exciting part with visualize and understand is uh, SnowSight. So SnowSight is our new uh, SQL text editor. Uh, it, it just, uh, you know, uh, I think went to public preview, uh, you know, recently. It was totally revamped. Uh, and one of the really cool things that it provides is easy ways to visualize your data. So it'll tell you things like ranges and, and percentiles and, 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 uh, and uh, outliers and be able to plot the data really quick without having to, uh, you know, export that data to a, a third party uh, BI tool. Um, so that makes that process, you know, super easy. Um, then moving on to feature, then the, the next column is feature engineering and transformation. You know, we support, you know, anti SQL, so that's, you know, really great. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, the use of external functions, which is, you know, uh, external function calls code that executes outside of Snowflake, for example, using AWS Lambda to help. Uh, you know, expand the ecosystem of what's possible within Snowflake. And we're going to be talking about that uh, a lot more in, in, you know, really soon. Um, and then also uh, uh, transformations using streams and tasks. So streams is just a, a, a way for Snowflake to record the changes made to a table, a change data capture. Uh, so uh, once you know what's changed, then you can create, you can have, schedule a task, and a task is just a way to schedule SQL execution to update, you know, those, uh, you know, your your tape, those tables uh, from the stream. So this makes like it's like it's like near continuous time uh, data pipeline, but it keeps you know all your data and transformations, you know, in the warehouse up to date, uh, which is would be super useful if you want to act really quickly. Um, then we talked about, uh, you know, where warehouse resizing, uh, you know, that's just like for the moment, you are in Excel and you say, I want, I want more performance. I can go to two Excel or I can just like create a, uh, you know, a new warehouse. And also uh, as a data scientist, which is really uh, interesting is uh, zero copy cloning. So say for example, you know, you want to do some kind of destructive, uh, you know, testing on a table. You want to try, you know, you want to delete some rows, delete some columns, you know, add columns, et cetera. Before, I mean, maybe maybe most people would have to like copy the table into like into their temp, uh, you know, uh, schema and then do all this stuff. Zero copy cloning allows you to do that without copying the base table. So you can imagine behind the scenes is it's tracking the changes versus like actually having to do that on a, on a, on a copy table, which is uh, very allows a lot of flexibility without the cost of copying and storage. So. Like I said before, all that, you know, you're getting your data, you're understanding it, you're augmenting it, you're doing feature transformation, you're doing that back and forth, back and forth. Now it comes to the point where you want to train a machine learning model. So now that's where we, our partner ecosystem comes into play, you know, partnering, you know, using the connector to H2O, you know, the H2O can access, you know, the training data, train the model. Um, and then, you know, you look at the performance and then you might go back and forth uh, and then, you want to deploy the model, and that's what we're going to talk about in a second of like, hey, how do we deploy a model on Snowflake and H2O using external functions? And then you want to, uh, once you do that, then you want to evaluate the model, right? You want to um, always see like the performance, is there model drift? If the model drift, you know, when should you retrain the model? If the, you know, if the error is starting to drift over time, you want to be able to, you know, monitor that. And you can do that within Snowflake. Uh, and then, and then you would have to kick off this process all again. So with that said, like I said, like 80% of the machine learning process is their preparation, um, which is, you know, where Snowflake excels. 
uh, you know, we're going to, uh, I'll kick it over to Eric, who's going to show the demo of like, hey, how are we going to, you know, using Snowflake and H2O and external functions, how did we make this, uh, this, this process more streamlined end to end? Great, thanks, Chris. <clears throat> okay, so okay, I've just shared my Snowflake um, uh, session, and you should see my worksheet. So what I'm going to go through and do is, how do we make all this driverless AI and Snowflake all work together in a seamless way uh, for users? It actually starts with using the external function. So the first thing we do is enable the uh, integration point with external functions. And what we're able to do at that point is then go ahead and invoke calls to, um, uh, to driverless AI. The way we do this is we create a function, and I created a function called H2O train. And what this is gonna do is allow me to go off and train um, a model uh, on driverless AI using data from Snowflake. So to do this, I start off with Lending Club 2, which is a table sitting inside of Snowflake. And at a minimum, I identify the target column, the column we're going to use in driverless to learn about the pattern and the data to make predictions. We have a couple of unique things that we do uh, here in Snowflake. The first one being is I want to clone the data. And what this, um, what this uh, cloning will do is it will take a snapshot of the data um, at the time of training. And that's really useful for auditability if you're in a, uh, an industry that is um, highly regulated you may need to save that for audit purposes. Once training has uh, completed, it will be deployed using the model name, in this case, uh, riskmodel.mojo. So I'm, I won't start one now because it will take uh, some time uh, to build. As Chris said, it goes through several iterations as it builds. So what we're going to do is look at one we did earlier. Um, you can see here, what we want to do now is understand the function that we need to define. So if I make the call, um, what will come back is the SQL definition that we need to use in order to make a call um, to this model from Snowflake. Uh, the user can actually just execute the SQL straight away. We filled in all the uh, connection details that we need and it will uh, be available straight away. Now, the, as you know, when we build a model in driverless, we might not use all of the columns, all the features in that table. So we generate a example SQL statement for the end user so they can see how to go and call uh, this new model that was just created. All they need to do is copy and paste and add in the table name to the query. Now, once we have done this, we now have a model that's ready to go. So I have a function here I created called H2O predict N, and I'm defining my model name that I want to use for this call, and then the columns from my, from my table. If I go ahead and execute this, you can see that, um, you know, in just over three seconds, we scored 39,000 rows. This was real time. This was going off from Snowflake to the uh, scoring inference engine, making those predictions and returning them to Snowflake. Um, what I've done here is I've, I've labeled the prediction when it came back. So I just did a, because it looks like a regular piece of SQL, I just added it in the prediction and we were able to go ahead and score. Now, one of the things that was mentioned earlier by Eve was you want to sometimes understand how you made this prediction. So you're able to also grab things like explainability. So explainability will give us the K-line reasons 
for any of the predictions that are made. What we've done here is written them into one particular column that shows all the uh, K-line reasons and the impact for each of these variables. So if you are in an industry where you need to keep those for audit reasons, you now have complete traceability. Because they're passing some of these parameters inside of the function, you also through Snowflake have an option to pass these as part of the function call itself in the header. So I created a, another function called H2O predict HDR, header for short, and I literally can just call this and it just looks like a regular piece of SQL and makes um, the call and defaults these parameters. Again, really quite quick, you know, just you know, 2.2 seconds for that, for that data. Because they look like a piece of SQL to the system, um, we're able to do anything you could do in Snowflake. So you want to do an update and update the table, you can just go ahead and call um, one of those functions. Um, but as we've gone through and built our model, you might want to understand where we are in the building process. <clears throat> and you remember we, we started this build off earlier and it might take some time to actually build a model. So as driverless builds its model, it actually updates Snowflake so the user knows exactly what's going on. We tell the user that the data has been sent over to Snowflake, that the model build has actually started and what the, uh, what the, uh, the instance of driverless is actually doing the build, and then the unique identifier for this particular experiment that's running. So that if a data scientist wants to go back and evaluate that within the driverless uh, UI or whether they want to look at this later on for auditing, they have that unique tracking ID all the way through. And then we tell them when the model is completed and when it's gone off and, and built. The same thing happens, <clears throat> same concept happens when we go to score. What we want to do here is uh, tell the, uh, the user what model was used for scoring, the request that came in and the response to the model itself. Um, and this is really handy because what you might want to do later on is go through that retraining exercise that, that Chris mentioned. Because the data is being stored in Snowflake for each of, these, um, each of these scoring requests, if you want to do uh, model drift detection using our drift monitor, you can just plug that straight in and use Snowflake as the repository for all of that data. But Snowflake has some unique capabilities. Um, and you know, Chris mentioned a couple of these early on. One of them is the idea of time travel. So quite often a data scientist might want to uh, create a new model and then compare um, data in that table to the original model that they had and the new model that was just created. So I can use time travel to look back at different snapshots of a table over time and use my model against different snapshots to see how it would behave. It's a really handy way to back test different models. One of the other features that we talked about earlier, or Chris talked about earlier, was the idea of tasks and uh, streams. So as data arrives, you can go ahead and invoke a, a model. So for example, we have a stream set up on the Lending Club data table. And as data arrives, we'll actually go ahead and update the, um, uh, the prediction for this being a bad loan. This is a lending club data to predict bad loans. So we can have that um, uh, be kicked off when the data arrives, either using streams or using tasks to wake up uh, as we need to. Um, anything that you want to do in SQL is now possible using, you know, using this approach. Um, and although we've done everything here in Snowflake, you might, for example, want to only train your data in driverless, but score it and make predictions using Snowflake. So you're able to do that by telling driverless not to train and only to make the predictions as well. So that means that if you have a secure environment or, or a governance process around deploying the models, it's super simple to actually have that fall into that uh, you know, that process you have today. 
So I hope that gives you a quick uh, insight to some of this. And what I want to do now is hand it to Isaac, so Isaac can tell us uh, a little bit more about the um, external function itself. Oops, as far as I can tell, we've lost. I think we have you on audio. Isaac, I think he might need to share his screen. I can, Isaac, let me know if you want me to share your slides. Isaac, are you still with us? Hi, Eve. This is Patrick. I think Isaac is probably trying to reconnect to audio. Do you mind just pulling up um, the slide deck in the meantime? Sure. Yeah. Um, and then, so, uh, Eric, uh, maybe there, there's a couple of questions that um, that came in, and we can wait until Isaac comes back. But uh, uh, one of the questions is, um, uh, related to the performance of the use of those external functions for scoring, and can uh, scoring be done real time? C can you elaborate a little bit on that? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. So it's a great question because you know performance is obviously a key attribute to both Snowflake and and H two O. Um, the way uh, the scores is it scores. It's a very scalable, very fast performance way. Um, you might have seen that you know I did um, about 39,000 rows in a little over two seconds. Um, so it's very, very fast for it to score. And because of the way uh, this works with Snowflake, applications that are built um, using Snowflake as a system and record could access this data and make the prediction in real time. So um, it suits both real time applications where you want to in you know, use a model um, and the enriched data coming from the model via Snowflake in your application. Or if you have a, you know, a batch orientated workflow that uses Snowflake, uh, you can certainly do that that way as well. And if Isaac is not yet with us, the other um, question is... Uh, I believe Isaac is back. The user I Isaac, are you there? I am. Should I pick it up? Yes, please. Apologies for the technical difficulties. So uh, thanks, Eric, for the, for the demo. Um, I wanted to uh, give a little bit of a quick peek, peek under the hood uh, on external functions and, and tell you a little bit about how it works and uh, how we see it being used both for machine learning and more broadly. So. First, uh, to set the stage a little bit, I want to give you a, a, a brief tour of how this uh, functionality yes, okay. actually Maybe. works. And so the, the, the main two actors here are Snowflake and some web service that you've provisioned somewhere out in the cloud. Uh, and so you imagine that I have, I have some of my data in Snowflake, uh, maybe data that I wish to score with, an ML model, and I'm going to issue a query. Now, Eric mentioned you can call these external functions really from any query, anywhere in a, in a SQL query that you like. You can put those queries into, into copy statements as you're moving data in. Uh, you can use them with streams and tasks to build them into your data pipelines as data come in. You can do things like use them in definitions of views or materialized views. And so they're very flexible components that are, are built fairly deeply into our query processor. So you can, you can integrate your external functionality anywhere into Snowflake that you like. Now, when you make a call like this, our query processor is going to, going to identify the records uh, uh, and the data that need to be sent off to your web service for action. And so we are going to make a series of post calls. Uh, these are batched, as I've sort of indicated here, with a, each, each call is going to have a set of rows that are handed off. And your endpoint uh, is going to receive these in a predefined format and can really sort of naively look at each record, perform the logic that it wants to do on it, and then hand those back 
again, in a series of, of batches. Uh, this is very straightforward to implement. Snowflake really takes care of associating the responses with the originating rows so that you get, you get those nicely matched up. Uh, we do things like retry logic in case there's a transient problem with a service. And so the, the code that you need to write is generally very straightforward. It takes a batch of records, it handles it in, in, a, in a very sort of independent way, and then hand, hands them back. Um, like I mentioned, these are batched, and we issue a, a number of these requests in parallel. Um, this gives us a, a, a very good um, sort of performance characteristic. Uh, as Eric mentioned, this, this works very quickly. People often have concerns about making these calls out, but uh, we make a lot fewer calls than, than you might expect, and we find that they actually perform really well. And of course, the other big concern that people have with a, a functionality like this is how are they, how are they secured? And so we actually use the cloud native IAM authentication to do the authorization over to uh, the authentication and the authorization over to um, the cloud provider. And so there's no keys here that you need to manage. There's there's a, a trust relationship that you set up between Snowflake uh, and your your endpoints. You're always in total control of what Snowflake can touch, uh, and you can secure those without actually having to manage any keys. So that's that's um, that's pretty slick once it's once it's set up. Um, we cover a lot of scenarios with this functionality. So this is really a broad extensibility hook that we've built into Snowflake. Those external functions, you can write them in whatever language you like. You know, I, I say Python or C++ or Go, but really, you know, if you can get uh, Commodore 64 up on the Internet, you could write your functionality there, and that's fine. I don't know how you're going to do that, but that would be fine. Uh, that code can call out to, to third-party uh, services. You can write your own custom logic in there. You can host that however you'd like. So Lambda services or cloud function, these sort of serverless, serverless technologies are a, a primary target of what we're doing. But as with the driverless AI, you can go and host that in a DC2 machine on AWS, for example, and, and, and host your endpoints there. Snowflake is, is really blissfully ignorant of the implementation. So you have broad latitude to build whatever logic you need. And so as H2O has seen, I think uh, moving your code so that it can interact with this really means uh, building a little bit of a shim. But you can really use most of the logic you have wherever it sits and however you like. And so uh, as we've seen here, one great application of this is data science and machine learning. And so we're, we're uh, able now to integrate very deeply with our good partners like H2O to do this. But there are a lot of other scenarios that we have explored. Um, if you saw on, on June 2nd, we did a, a, our launch of this, and I did a number of demos there using lang language services like Amazon's Translate service, um, which you, know, you open up now the ability to make use of very sophisticated logic uh, in platforms like that that sits outside. Uh, geo geolocation or geocoding services, um, so a number of providers like Google and Esri um, all have geocoding services, which is a very sophisticated uh, process, really, to take a string and understand what that string means and then turn it into geographic information. Uh, you can open this up and make use of that now within Snowflake, and that dovetails really nicely with the new geospatial types that we have uh, in Snowflake. Um, access to live data. So we have customers that are doing things like, like looking at live stock prices or you know, in, in a uh, ad placement kind of scenario, looking at the live prices for websites and being able to pull that in really as part of a query. So instead of having to do, you know, daily or hourly loads of that, you can get the absolute freshest data right as part of your queries. And then, of course, you can bring any of your complex logic that you might have defined. So, you know, we have, we have customers that do things like risk assessment or credit scoring, and they've got very sophisticated logic that take parameters on on clients, on users, that um, they want to feed into that logic. They want to share that logic across the enterprise, not just use it in the database. But now they can open up and directly access that right from their database as well. Uh, when we built this functionality, we really had three distinct audiences in mind. So the first audience is the developer. The developer needs to know a little bit about how to build the code how to interpret a batch of records and return it. It's straightforward, but it requires a little sophistication. 
Uh, and they need to know how to deploy that logic up to AWS and wire it through, or really, in the future, there'll be any cloud provider, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, the second audience that we really kept in mind was the administrator, whose responsibility it is to secure that system and make sure that, that the data in it is, is kept safe. Um, they really always retain full control over who can create these uh, functions uh, and where those calls can go. So data exfiltration from Snowflake. It is a user intentionally or, or probably more often unintentionally taking the data from a database and, and putting it to a, a, a place out on the internet that isn't, isn't properly secured is a major concern of administrators. And so they really have control here over where these endpoints can connect to and make sure that those are, are good trusted entities. And of course, who can then use these functions once they exist? And then finally, the user. And for the user, this is all very simple. As we've seen, you just write queries. And these functions, you can tell that they're external if you care, but for the most part, they work just like built-in functions. Uh, finally, I'd like to just touch a little bit on the roadmap. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, we did release this. It's uh, uh, on June 2nd. We, we released this in public preview. It's available to all users right now. So if you have a Snowflake account, if you create a Snowflake account, you can go and play with this immediately. Uh, there's nothing to sign up for, nothing to turn on. Uh, we have a few limitations today. So the, the biggest one is that we've talked a bit about AWS. The target endpoints today have to live in AWS. Uh, we will be lifting that. But uh, you can call this if you have a Snowflake account in Azure or, or, or GCP. You can still use this, but you have to be calling over to AWS today. And then we only have scalar functions. So think about this as functions that would show up in the Slack tool where clause of a query. Uh, and so those, that's, that's a limitation for now, but we'll, we're looking at ways to lift that. Uh, and so coming soon, uh, as, as, as we've hinted, um, we're, we're expanding our support to include the other major cloud providers, Azure and GCP, where Snowflake has its deployments. Uh, and then there's a set of sort of additional little improvements that we're making to performance. Um, this is both uh, in adding additional ways to transmit the data. So we'll, we'll have the ability, for example, to transmit your data in an arrow format as, in addition to JSON, which is how it works today as well as some improvements to our internal optimization so that we can make the most efficient use of these functions. And then we're going to GA. So by the end of the year, we're expecting to have this out in fully supported uh, general availability. Uh, and then in the works, we are adding additional calling functions, uh, calling patterns rather, like table functions. So that would mean things like, like a, a, a more uh, native integration with things like uh, ML training would be a good example. But there are other, there is other functionality that um, sort of better fits slightly different calling patterns. We need to operate over batches of records as opposed to working row by row. And then the other big thing, and this is really a, a, a large sort of additional path that we're on, is we're working on bringing some of this functionality directly into Snowflake. And so as we've announced, uh, we, are, we are working on bringing um, Java functions directly into Snowflake. So they'll run in our engine right next to your data. Uh, that we're expecting to be into, into a preview, limited preview uh, by the end of the year, but we do have it working in-house already today uh, on, on uh, some simple instances. Um, and we're already working with folks like H2O to bring some of their Mojo functionality directly into the engine, which is really exciting because now you can, now you can go train your models and then bring those models right into Snowflake and avoid any data movement. We see the performance for external functions is really pretty good, but you know, nothing beats being right next to your data. So that gives you an idea of where we are and what this does more broadly and uh, where we're going. And I think with that, I will hand this uh, back to Patrick to close this out and uh, sort of moderate some questions. Hey, thanks. Uh, thanks, Isaac. Um, uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, highlight as well, uh, anybody who has more questions or wants to engage, uh, with H2O and Snowflake uh, on that uh, joint solution we demonstrated. Feel free to reach out to myself, uh, Eve Lawrence, and you have my email address there. If uh, you want to reach out to Snowflake, you can uh, reach out to uh, my partner in crime, uh, AJ uh, von Massenhausen, and you have his email there as well. So uh, we'd love to hear from you uh, on how that uh, capability applies uh, to your environment. 
there are a couple of questions that uh, we received, and um, uh, a couple of them are related to the use of um, H2O as a remote service and the implication it has of transferring data uh, from uh, Snowflake to the driverless uh, instance uh, using external function and um, uh, how big the data sets can be and the potential cost implication uh, of that. So I'm not sure if Eric or Isaac, if you guys can uh, take this one on. Yeah, maybe I can, this is Isaac, maybe I can hop in there. Um, yes, so we are going to be transferring the data out. Uh, it depends, obviously, how much, how much data transfer will depend on exactly how you use the functionality. But if you sort of imagine you know, maybe a typical, a typical record that you might send out to, uh, to H2O might be, say, 100 bytes. And if you were to score a million records, now we're talking about you know, 100 megabytes that are being transferred. Uh, we'll compress that. By default, we compress that on AWS. Um, the, the API gateway that we, go, uh, that we go against in AWS actually will very transparently de uh, decompress that. So you don't even need to worry about the compression. So we'll get that. If you imagine maybe this compresses down to, you know, instead of 100 megabytes being sent, maybe you know, 20 or 50. Um, but uh, we will, um, we, we pass along effectively the data transfer cost that you have. Uh, AWS will, will charge something on the order of 7 cents a gigabyte. So if we're talking about scoring, you know, 100, uh, say, a, say a million records rather, uh, we're talking about fractions of a penny to actually do the data transfer. So, um, you know, right now we're tracking the, uh, the amount of spend that we're, we're seeing across all of Snowflake for this feature, and it's kind of a trivial amount of money that, that is, being, uh, is being spent there. So um, unless you're doing something really huge, uh, it really doesn't seem like it's a huge, uh, huge, um, a huge cost. And of course, you can also further uh, winnow that down if you reduce the number of parameters you send up. We're only sending the, the columns that the function requires, so it's not the whole table. Great, thanks, uh, thanks, Isaac. Uh, another question is related to the amount of models that a customer might have deployed, and um, if they still can use of the external function capability as demonstrated, or if, is it uh, more feasible, better to do it more in a traditional fashion where you export data uh, for scoring and write it back uh, in the scenario of uh, a range of models being implemented. Uh, Eric, maybe you might be in a better position to talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Um, so the great thing about this integration is we're not forcing you to do either or. You could actually do a mix. Um, the nice thing about leveraging um, uh, the integration so that you can call to train and call to um, make predictions is that you don't have to you know, extract the data. It's a very natural way to enrich the data inside of Snowflake. Um, but if I wanted to um, go into driverless and train the model in driverless um, directly through the driverless UI, you can still do that exactly the same way you do today. We have a connector from driverless to Snowflake to pull the data in. Um, you can do your experimentation you know, study the uh, resulting model. And then when you're ready, um, that model can be deployed uh, and accessed directly from Snowflake just by calling the, uh, the function and then uh, making the call, the SQL call, as we showed in the demo. So there are some models that, you know, would work really well just by retraining themselves and doing everything through Snowflake. And there are others that you might want to have a human intervention, either mix the media either way, whichever way you find the easiest, you're not being forced into any one pattern. I would just add to that maybe that from the Snowflake perspective, having the function declared so that you can call them really does nothing, right? That is, there's no charge to have a function. There's no real overhead to have a function around. You don't only end up uh, incurring any, any data transfer cost or any cost whatsoever when you actually use it. So there's really no reason uh, from Snowflake's perspective, not to have these uh, declared and available. Yeah, uh, thanks, Isaac. Um, uh, maybe let me take two more questions. Uh, 
One is related uh, to uh, can we train uh, within Snowflake? And Isaac, you, you talked a little bit about this related to the Java function. Do you quickly maybe want to uh, uh, reinforce uh, what uh, what direction we're taking on this? Yeah, that's right. So Snowflake itself doesn't have any uh, built-in machine learning. Um, we're really relying very much on our partners. Uh, we've got a, 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 a good set of them, including H2O, uh, who's been very very deeply involved with us with the external function work, and it's, it's probably one of the best uh, integrated uh, with this um, at this point. Uh, right now, the training, of course, takes place outside, and in fact, what you're seeing with external functions is the scoring also is taking place outside. With Java functions, uh, that is a potential future directions we could pull this in, uh, and we still rely on our partners to provide a lot of the logic, but now those partners can move that logic uh, into Snowflake and probably get better performance and, of course, less data transfer out of that. And so that's a future direction. I think the first, the first step will be scoring, but yeah, long term, bringing training in uh, in this way would entirely be possible. Thanks, Isaac. And uh, I know we're getting close to the top of the hour. Final question, and that's going to be one for you, Eric. Um, regarding the complexity of setting uh, this environment up that you demonstrated, uh, how difficult is it to uh, to get this set up? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, you know, security is key, as as Isaac said, right? We want to ensure that um, you know Snowflake is talking to the inference engine and driverless, and that the data is safe all the way, right? So. Um, there is that, uh, you know, the, the trust relationship with the role. When we go to do the install, we um, we actually leverage the API um, available in AWS. And what that allows us to do is to actually set up um, the, the gateway uh, that Isaac just mentioned, which is the AWS gateway that talks from Snowflake to, to us, or actually, well, to your BPC. Um, I should mention that all of the H2O pieces run in your environment, in your VPC or in your prem. Not H2O is not hosting anything. Um, and the install program does the entire setup. Um, it sets up the gateway, it sets up the roles, it adds the IM role that you define. Um, so it's literally a few minutes to actually go through and, and do. It's all under your control. You can override it any any stage. Uh, but the idea is to make it super simple for the administrator to set up. And then these steps we showed in the demo for the user to define the function to make it as simple as we can to consume the models and leverage the data inside of Snowflake. Thanks, Eric. Uh, I think that's all what we have time for. Patrick, any, any closing uh, comments? Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Eve, Eric, Isaac, and Chris for taking the time today and doing a great presentation. I'd like to thank everyone who joined us today as well. Uh, the presentation slides and the recording will be made available on our Bright Talk channel, and we hope you have a great rest of your day.